So good evening and good morning, dear guests. For those like in Canada or in the United States and then in Europe, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our event today titled The Midic Future, an evening with Dr. Larissa Light, author of the Tiger Flu and Iron Goddess of Mercy, interviewed by Dr. Conrad Scott, hosted by the Department of English Language and Literature at Cappadocia University. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Conrad Scott to you. Conrad Scott holds a PhD from and is an instructor in the University of Alberta's Department of English and Film Studies on Treaty 6 and Metis Lens. He researches contemporary science fiction and environmental literature, and his current project examines the interconnection between place, culture, and literature in a study of environment and dystopia in contemporary North American fiction. His reviews and essays have appeared in science fiction studies, extrapolation, paradoxa, the goose, environmental philosophy, undercurrents, and Canadian literature. He is also the author of Borderline Immersion. Yes, Conrad, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much for accepting to facilitate this panel. Thank you very much, Emra. Hello, Hello, and welcome from the University of Alberta near the North Saskatchewan River in Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakoda Sioux peoples. It is with gratitude as a visitor here that I acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you very much to both Dr. Lai and Dr. Amram Adesoy for inviting me today. It is a great pleasure to participate in this event with Cappadocia University. The mythic future during which Dr. Larissa Lai will read from excerpts from the Tiger Flu and Iron Goddess of Mercy in conversation with myself. To me, the title of the event reflects the modes and capacities with which we gaze at the oncoming future while carrying the stories, knowledge, myths, and influences from our past. Both of Dr. Lai's books featured today thoughtfully speak to such considerations. Larissa Lai has written eight books, including The Tiger Flu and Iron Goddess of Mercy, recipient of the Duggins Novelist Prize, the Lambda Literary Award, the Astrazea Award and finalist for the Otherwise Award, the Books in Canada First Novel Award, and the Dorothy Lives Say Poetry Prize, she holds a Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary, where she directs the Insurgent Architects House for Creative Writing. I would now like to invite her to read from the first chapter of The Tiger Flu. Sorry. sorry about that. I was headed off in order to kind of try to minimize the echo. I just wanted to thank Dr. Conrad Scott for that lovely introduction and also Dr. Emra Atasoy for inviting me um, and Conrad both here uh, to speak to you today. Um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here um, virtually at the University of Cappadocia. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region uh, in Southern Alberta, where I live and work. Um, these include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pigani, the Gaina um, First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation, uh, and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nation, West Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary, where I live, uh, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, so I'm honored and, and happy to be coming to you from this place and, and, and grateful to have a, a home here. Uh, I'm going to start by reading to you uh, from the very beginning of the Tiger Flu. Um, so the novel uh, is comprised of, of two voices. I'm going to read to you from the very first chapter. It's the first voice. It'll give you a little bit of a sense of, um, of the world of the novel and, and one of the key characters. So it's chapter one. It's called The Fourth Wave. And the speaker uh, is a young woman called Cora Co. And the place is Saltwater Flats in the first quarantine ring. Uh, and it's the near future. So time is measured in a number of different ways, which I think we're gonna talk about, but it's marked by the beginning of summer and it's the 15th day of the node called Summer Begins. Behind the clouds of the new monsoon, 
the ancient mainframe Chang rolls too fast across the sky. He's a big guy, but he appears much bigger than he should because his orbit is deteriorating. His period is down to two hours now, and he casts a veiled shadow over the rooftop of the old Woodward's building, engulfing Uncle Y's carefully cultivated garden. Cora leans against the fence that holds old Delphine in her pen, stares mournfully into Delphine's golden eyes. Uncle Wise got it, she tells the goat. The tendril information scales Cora's got plugged into the single band halo that circles her head, wave gently. For all Chang is so close, the people of Saltwater Flats don't have access to him anymore. Only the citizens of the glass towers in Saltwater City can tap in. As soon as she can afford it, she'll add rings to her halo or even a full helmet so she can get wiser, quicker. She needs all the help she can get. Ma, says old Delphine. K2's also sick. Ma. Uncle Y says that so is big brother Everest, though I've never met him. If he comes back to us, he could save us, but I don't think he's coming back. <laughs> and Charlotte's got it. Cora never calls Charlotte mom. It seems too corny. Women aren't immune, you know, Delphine. If they're hungry enough, if they're depleted enough, women can get it. If Charlotte's got it, that means I'm the only one left in our family who doesn't have the tiger flu. Me? Don't be like that. Cora knows Delphine cannot actually understand her grief and dread, but still the tendril scales atop Cora's head droop. She scratches the old goat between the eyes. Delphine's hair is pleasantly coarse and her forehead is warm. Soon it will be you and me against the world. Behind Cora, the jars in which Uncle Y grows potatoes lean against crumbling retainer walls. The jars are huge, each one big enough to hold Cora, her goat, and a couple of tigers too. Forty floors below those walls, in the streets of saltwater flats, women, young and old, healthy and ill, happy and sad, go about their daily business, shop for a bit of chicken for supper, a few vegetables, a bicycle, a second-hand cake mixer. A wealthy few rest in quiet cafes, sip tea and eat steamed buns. Others stand on street corners, arguing. There are no men in the streets. The men are shut up in houses, covered in lesions and coughing their lungs out, the nasty and condescending beside the gentle and well-intentioned. Or else they are already dead except for the tiger men, a small contingent of male survivors who have the flu and all its contagion, but whose symptoms never proceed beyond a modest cough and the occasional lesion. Miraculously, they thrive in the privacy of the Pacific Pearl Parkade, doors closed to the world. Although the tiger flu has a taste for men, it doesn't discriminate against the wealthy. In fact, the first to succumb to the fourth wave was the hated despot Aloysius Chow McPherson. The citizens of Saltwater City rejoiced, as did the denizens of the surrounding quarantine ring known as Saltwater Flats. Then Chow McPherson's kindly brother, Ferdinand, took ill. The people still rejoiced because, though kind, Ferdinand was a high-ranking member of a despotic family. The family company, Host Light Industries, ruled the city in its own best interests. Chow McPherson's wife, Sophia, took charge, but she too got sick. Then his daughter, Isabel, took over. As Cora is all her family's got, Isabel is all the city has got. She better be enough. Far behind Chang, the backup mainframe Aang rolls in her expanding orbit. If Isabel could open diplomatic channels with the Cosmopolitan Earth Council, which controls the last remaining rockets outside the United Middle Kingdom, perhaps they could be convinced to help right the orbits of Chang and Eng. Otherwise, Eng's elliptical orbit will only deepen, 
and hundreds of years will pass between sightings. Delphine lies down in her bed of straw. See you tomorrow, sweet goat. Cora places her hands on the highest rung of the fence, hikes herself up so she can lean in and plant a kiss on the goat's rough forehead. Something rustles behind the shed. She drops her feet back to the ground. Who's there? No answer. She goes to look, but before she's taken half a step, a young man leaps out and grabs her from behind. Boo! Motherfuck, get off me. Who the hell are you? Actually, she recognizes him. He's a friend of her brother's, Stash Sachs. He looks awful. His face is covered in weeping sores. His eyes ooze pus. What happened to you? How did you get up here? K2 gave me the keys. We lost our jobs this week because we're too sick to lift the elk at the abattoir. That's awful. He grips her tighter, nibbles her ear. Please let go. He doesn't. I mean it. You don't want me to hug you anymore? Stash, I would rather hug a grist sister. Let go, really. Dirty Coraco, says the boy. There's no such thing as grist sisters. They're just a story told by scared old men. The bear hug from behind turns aggressive. Let go of me, her scales writhe. When I wasn't sick, you liked me just fine. I did not, I hardly know you. The last healthy member of the Coe family. He leans in, licks her face with his white tongue. Ugh, what are you trying to do? He bites her cheek hard enough to break skin. Trying to give me your disease? He's fierce, but he's thin, even thinner than Cora. She might be hungry, but she's tough as an old shoe, where he's where he whereas he's pale and wasted. She kicks a foot out from under him. Little whore, what did you do that for? He pulls her to the ground with him, rubs his face into hers, tries to stick his tongue in her mouth. Get off me, rolls him over. Gripped by jealousy and desire, he won't let go. On the battered concrete floor that once kept water out of the apartments below, they roll over one another, closer and closer to Uncle Y's potato jars and the crumbling wall. They'll go over the edge if they aren't careful. Cora throws her weight in the opposite direction towards Delphine's pen. She's heavier than Stash. Back they roll. Her weight on him makes his heart pump. He finds fresh strength. Towards the wall, they turn again. You little shit, I'm going to beat the fuck out of you. Cora won't be defeated. She jams her shoulder hard against his and forces their momentum back Delphine's way. Rage grips him, makes him superhuman for a moment. They spiral furiously into a jar. It tips over and hits the wall. Fragments of loose concrete clatter to the ground 40 floors below. The wall gives. The jar crashes overboard and smashes onto the sidewalk. I'm not gonna die just cause you are. She forces him back and they roll all the way to Delphine's fence. The old goat bleats panic. It isn't fair, he pushes on top of her again, rolls her towards the brink as she attempts to pull her arm free to punch him. Here's the edge. There's no wall to protect them. Holy shit, holy shit, they're gonna fall. Over the ledge they go. Cora grabs a coil of loose rebar. The sick boy clings to her waist, I don't wanna die. She could kick him in the belly and he would plummet. She feels the temptation. Her arm begins to quiver. She can't hold their weight much longer. She has to decide now. She hoists them both back up to the safety of the rooftop garden. You little fuck, she hisses. The monsoon clouds burst open and shower them. Stash trembles flat on his belly beside her, gets a hold of himself and gives her a crooked grin, half malevolent, half malevolent half teasing. Piss off, Cora says. I don't care if you are my brother's friend. You're not welcome in my house. So that's the first chapter. Thanks so much for uh, for listening. Thanks very much, Larissa, for that uh, first reading excerpt for us. Um, so this is a, 
uh, an obvious question perhaps, but uh, the tiger flu is notably pandemic fiction about our potential future and was published in 2018 before the current real world reality of the pandemic life. Uh, can you comment for us on what must be a surreal experience as an author imagining the future of the scenario? Sure, sure. Yeah, of course I can, Conrad. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, so it was indeed quite a sort of strange and uncanny coincidence to have completed a novel about a pandemic right before the actual COVID-19 hit. Um, and, it, and it was quite strange. And I think you know, the initial sort of, um, my initial feeling when COVID first hit was, uh, it, it weirdly felt just like a continuity of the world of the writing. So it was as though this world that I'd been inhabiting privately, this novel was very, very long in the writing for a, for a number of reasons, of 16 years I was working on it. Um, and so I'd been inhabiting that, you know, the strangeness of this pandemic world in a sense for, for 16 years. Um, and when the actual pandemic hit, it did feel a little bit like this sort of private world of novel writing became the world that, you know, I was suddenly collectively inhabiting with everybody else that I knew. Um, I found myself, I mean, I think I was a lot more prepared than most people when the, when the pandemic started. So, I mean, a very, very early days before anybody else was thinking, not before anybody else, but before many people were thinking about it, I. You know, I was in the supermarket stocking up on things because of all the cans, right, in the tiger flu. Um, and so I was thinking, oh, gosh, you know, like maybe this is no big deal, but maybe it is a big deal. And I need to be and I need to be prepared and I need to be thinking. So there was a little bit of sort of that kind of um, uh, preparedness thing going on. And then on the other hand, this sort of strange sense of um, this strange sense of uh, already in, already inhabiting and not necessarily, I mean, I think in some ways I knew what to do and in other ways I'd already sort of found a way to be and maybe it was more that than anything that, um, that shaped, you know, my, my initial experience of, um, of the pandemic when it started. I like how you put that as already inhabiting uh, because one of the elements that really fascinates me about uh, this novel is you've taken some real world places, the ones that we would recognize today and place names of today even and altered them for the social understandings of this future narrative, which is set in what we know now as the Cascadia watershed, which is my background map right now on the, on the Zoom. Uh, so downtown Vancouver is Saltwater City. Greater Vancouver is Saltwater Flats, I think. Uh, Penticton is Pentahicton in the novel. Uh, can you speak to the decisions about adapting place names and a sense of place for this future world? Sure, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, you're really right to observe actually that this notion of inhabiting, you know, I've been thinking about it for a long time, actually in a number of different ways. Um, uh, you know, partly for like being a, um, an Asian Canadian queer person in a society that is largely, does, largely does not inhabit that identity. The work of inhabitation has been present in my work from the get-go, I think. So my first novel, for instance, When Fox is a Thousand, thinks actively, right, about the problem of inhabitation. Um, but uh, in relation to the place names uh, in particular, um, you know, Saltwater City is the old Chinese name for Vancouver. So it was the name, and for, um, for any listeners who might be interested, there's a wonderful book that's called Saltwater City by, um, by, the, um, by the historian Paul Yi. Uh, so yeah, even before it was called Gold Mountain, it was called Saltwater City. So in, in a lot of ways, my uptake of the name Saltwater City is, is a recuperation, um, as is the name Pentahicton, which I think is the old indigenous name of that city. Um, and so I'm trying to recuperate in a lot of the namings, um, uh, names, that, names, that were, names that were already names that were already existing. Um, and then Saltwater Flats is um, uh, a derivative, obviously, of, of, of Saltwater City, um, and a way for me to think about the layers of quarantine rings that are built into the world of the novel. Um, yeah, I think you're going to ask me about other kinds of names later, so maybe I won't comment until. Sure. Uh, on the pipeline. Yeah. 
I, I like how you commented about Pentahicton because the other uh, indigenous name that I noticed was, uh, I can't, I, mean, I think it's pretty early in the novel, but there's a comment about across the Stolo, which is of course the Fraser River, I believe, uh, you know, the, the indigenous name for this, the Fraser River. That's right. um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, are also Stolo are also a people, right? It's of course. In, in, so like Lee Maracle, the writer is, it comes like, is, an, is, a, is a, um, a knowledge keeper for the Stolo, but it is indeed the previous name of the Fraser River, yes. Because yeah. uh, it inhabits, those people have inhabited it for, you know, time immemorial. Uh, and so that, I really like that re, retaking of those names or replacing of those uh, names. Um, and th these kinds of uh, name changes or a place considerations uh, echo other current elements that you populate the novel with. Uh, one of these I think would be something like the techno authoritarianism of who can access knowledge and memories about the past of the novel, which are started satellite mainframes. Uh, Chang and Anger both mentioned in that first reading that you you had. Uh, so can you say more about the social dynamics driving this technological element? Uh, how would you articulate the difference between the satellites Chang and Ang, for instance? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a really, really great question. You know, there, it was a real, it was fun and kind of an interesting, for me, an interesting exercise and work of, you know, literary inhabitation to bring those names not into the present, but into the future in a sense that, you know, because the names are historical in some cases or they're, you know, they're ongoing names that have been um, largely buried by the, by the colonial project to think about them as having a futurity. You know, for me, I mean, it was partly a political act, but it was also really interesting to use them and in so doing be able to make present a past that has always been there, but has been kind of submerged um, and sort of bring it out of the water, you know, water of the past, if you, if you like, into the into the ground of the of the future or something like that. Uh, in terms of the techno authoritarian aspects of the novel, yeah, I mean, for sure, this novel really kind of radically reorients. Um, it's a it's a reorientation or an extrapolation from the techno politics of our present moment, right? So I'm sort of bringing forward. Um, some of the elements of our present world, like, well, we have a separatist movement right here in Alberta, but it's not the only separatist movement on Turtle Island. And um, we're, I think we're living in a moment, you know, when there are political impulses, some of them quite extreme, that are pushing for other political formations. And the political formation of the globe, as we know, is, radic is radically shifting. And I think you know, for anybody who's lived through the, the Trump years in the US, I mean, we're north of there, but we still experience it um, quite profoundly. You can see how these other political imaginations of the world are also um, always already present with us. And um, so in the imagination of the novel, I'm sort of imagining some changes for the good and some changes not, not so much so. Um, so there's a sort of a combination of those. So for instance, you get this place called Cascadia right, that you've got on the map behind you, that is one imagination of how the Pacific Northwest region, region could form a, a, a kind of um, political associates and, um, and a, 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 political, um, a political entity. So in the world of the novel, it materializes. And then likewise, uh, in the world of the novel, you know, we can see China is rising so intensely now. And, um, uh, so in the world of the novel, it has risen even that much more and its influence into the lives of uh, all of all of the characters um, is, is, is sort of uh, ever present and kind of pervasive. Um, so I'm thinking about those kinds of things. I'm thinking about uh, in relation to Chang and Aang. Um, so these are uh, one of the other things, I suppose, that the, that the novel um, predicted or might be said to predict is the intensification of our lives online, right? Like here we are on Zoom, uh, gathering together in ways that before the pandemic, I mean, I used to use Skype a little bit sometimes, but Zoom maybe only once or twice for a very, very fancy meeting with somebody who could afford the platform. And suddenly, you know, here we are all on it. So in the world of the novel, um, our lives online are even more deeply intensified 
um, and Chang and Aang are these two uh, satellite mainframes um, that have been shot up into space at a time when uh, petroleum is still the main fuel that everybody is using. Oil is still extant, it's still a, a thing. And uh, in the world of the novel, now it's only the elites who you know, have access to it. So sort of cor corporate elites primarily um, in the Cascadia region. So it's, Cascadia is imagined as a country, but not a very strong one. And the corporations are stronger than the nation uh, in that case. But in the case of the United Middle Kingdom, it's the nation that's stronger and the corporations are still strong inside it. And so anyway, it's those people, the people sort of at the, inside the corporations who have access to Chang and Aang and the rest of the people don't. So then you have people like um, Kirilo who we'll meet shortly, uh, who um, has absolutely no, no access. She can still see Chang and Aang rise and set. So there are these large um, uh, satellites um, that are so big in the sky that they seem like moons and light, light, and light it up and she can see them but she can't access the mainframe capacity of them. And so has the internet, right, essentially. And, uh, and, so, and, so has, um, and so has no, and so has no access. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I'll say about those for now. Yeah, uh, I mean, I noticed with, with oh, sorry, go ahead. Chang and Ng, no, one more thing about Chang and Ng. Um, they're, so they're named after the two um, Chinese Siamese twins who came to the US uh, in the early 1800s and toured as curiosities. They were conjoined, uh, conjoined twins. And so I've borrowed the name again to sort of remember um, that moment and the ways in which you know, Asian bodies were sort of weirdly deployed into colonized spaces. And yeah. so I'm thinking about these two satellites as having a kind of kinship with their namesakes. Sorry, sorry, please. No, no, yeah, that, that's, uh, thank you for speaking to the inhabitant in such an eloquent way. Um, and you also spoke to this, this idea of extrapolation forward from the world today uh, in various ways. And, and I think in the novel, this includes, uh, you know, things like regional climate change and those kinds of facts. There's uh, an acid rainstorm that you didn't quite uh, read that part in the first chapter, but I think it's, it's pretty soon into the novel, there's acid rainstorm. And even uh, I think Chang affects, you know, when the monsoon is going to happen because of its, as you said, almost a moon, uh, this this you know, metallic electronic thing, it's almost a moon. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, you know, in, in terms of those lines of thinking, what kinds of research you might have done in framing the changes such as, you know, climate change, uh, uh, changes to places and spaces, technological changes for this future of our world? Sure, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that, Conrad. Um, so thank goodness for the internet in a lot of ways, even as I'm disparaging the internet. I sure used it a lot. And I was very, um, you know, one of the things that I was very determined to think about in this novel is the way in which forces interact. So you do indeed have Chang in particular, because Chang is falling to earth. Um, so you know, the oil is no longer um, is no longer uh, um, a source of energy. It's um, it's been dried up or used up. People just don't have access to it anymore, and uh, it means that they can't launch rockets. That's not true. There's one country that can la launch rockets, but for the most part, um, our rocket technology is not available to most people. And so, unless you're in the um, in the good books of the Cosmopolitan Earth Council. There's nothing you can do to right the orbit of um, of a falling satellite, and Chang is falling slowly. The orbit's deteriorating, and eventually he's going to fall into. Well, I better not tell you. Um, uh, but uh, Ang, the orbit is also deteriorating, but it's deteriorating in the other direction. So she's falling into this long ellipsis. Uh, and so, yes, I had to do a fair bit of research to sort of figure out if these things could actually happen. And I hope I've got it right. You know, I'm expecting to hear any time from somebody who's way better at the science than me. But I did go on to that. Shoot, I should have Googled it, Googled it before we came on. There is a, there's a platform that you can go to to ask, like for, for spec fiction writers in particular. And you can go in there and sort of ask the geek world, um, is such a thing possible? And people will respond to you and you know give you and so i did i did a fair bit of research about um 
about satellites, about orbit, about climate change, about how the weather might change, um, about the migrations of, uh, of, of plants and animals, um, about diseases. It really, this kind of, you know, because a novel like this, I mean, I think all spec fiction requires that, a deep attention to the building of the world. I did so much world building research and, um, yeah, I mean, most of it just on the internet or, you know, through my university library. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Well, one about calendars as well. I did a lot of research on the Chinese traditional, on the Chinese traditional calendar. Um, yeah, most of it online though, Conrad, and occasional yeah. conversations with, with, um, with friends and allies, but most of it um, just, you know, rousting through the through the internet with all of the information that's available to us these days. Yeah, I guess the the process of research would really change. You, know, you read about how, say, Octavia Butler did her research. She had boxes of newspaper clippings, those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, you know. uh, so you we were just mentioning the calendar, which really fits into my next question that I had lined up. Uh, and this this echoes some things you've already said, which is that there's no more oil, no more fossil fuels that are at least accessible to most people. So this is a post-petrocultural society. Uh, and it, it factors even into the way that time is framed in, in many ways, as you said in the book. One of those is time after oil, or towel, I guess, a time stamp. Uh, so I was kind of wondering how you decided on when to set your narrative in the future, you know, how forward, far forward into the future. Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, initially with this novel, the thing that I want to do, do the most was use the Chinese traditional um, calendar system in which the year is something like, I can't tell you what it is, but it's like 3000 and something um, in, on that calendar, just to get us think to register, um, you know, that time itself is a colonial force and that, um, that not everybody thinks about it or measures it in the same kind of way. And also because because the traditional calendar is lunar. And so to sort of have time marked by the moon, I felt in a way was another way of gesturing to the strangeness of Chang and Ng and their, their sort of artificial place in the sky. Um, uh, so that was my initial, that was the thing that I probably spent the most time thinking about. And then at the end of the day, you know, I gave it to beta readers and certainly after like placing it in the hands of editors, everybody was like, we don't understand the system of, I've been calling them nodes, the closest thing would be months. We don't understand the system of months. We don't understand the system of years. It's too confusing. You have to do something about it. So that was very sad for me to have to let that go. But it also did make the work easier because I was struggling to keep track of it. <laughs> Um, so that for me was more important than when in the future. Um, but I did also think about, for sure, so think about when exactly, and I figured about a hundred years from now, I would set it just to give things enough time to change and for the technologies to, um, to advance to the point where it might be in some way. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these people who's super fixated on realism. I guess that's why I, I would call it speculative fiction rather than science fiction. Um, and yet I sort of, I've realized from, you know, experimenting other way in other ways with writing fictions that are very, very divorced from the world as we inhabit it to realize that that doesn't work so well. People in the actual present as it exists need hooks of some kind. So I figured a hundred years who knew it would come the next year, right? Who knew that it would come the next year? So I don't know if that was right. Like, I don't know if that 100 year calculation really works or if it matters. Yeah, I mean, it must be very difficult measuring these particular outcomes. Pandemics obviously is now here, but you know, uh, we're experiencing sea level rise at a different you know, rate, those kinds of things. Uh, or aspects like the sixth mass extinction, uh, you know, and you've got, uh, I think a sense of technological fixes to different issues that are, you know, happening now uh, that that might extrapolate into the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. In general, how do you see this novel uh, addressing those technological fixes of problems now? Right, right, sure. So, you know, the other thing about time is 
Um, and you see this happening with a lot of spec, especially around the turn of the millennium, where we realize quickly that, you know, writers sort of judge, judgment of the amount of time required for something to unfold. Like even think about Orwell's 1984, right? Yeah. Um, and all the Orwellian things that are still unfolding, it's well past 1984 actually, and yet he still remains relevant. Um, and so part of the impulse around the Chinese system of time was that it wouldn't, uh, for most contemporary readers, register as any particular time in the future. So just to add that. But okay, just think about the sixth mass extinction and all of the pictures. Now, I guess the big thing that's happening in the novel um, is the, um, in response to that, is the, the de-extinction of the Caspian tiger which is essentially what causes the flu, right? So there's a company that decides it's gonna de-extinct this tiger, but not in or not for the tiger's sake, but in order to make money, in order to make tiger bone wine. Um, and so I'm thinking about intensifications of capital as well and the ways in which, you know, the science that's available to us is available. Um, and when something's available, human beings tend to just deploy it, right? It's a kind of sorcerer's apprentice kind of logic in a lot of ways. Um, if it's available, somebody's going to deploy it. Are they going to deploy it for the best possible reasons? Quite possibly not. Um, or quite possibly in some cases, yes, as in the technology that's used to cure the tiger flu, they're genuinely trying to do something good. But it's in such a, it's in such a kind of culturally clueless way that they're incapable of seeing the harm caused at the same time. And so I am for sure thinking, you know, about human beings as, as, as primates that meddle, primates that think and primates that meddle without necessarily the deeper wisdom required to <coughs> employ the sort of the fiddly hand-based, mind-based, monkey-ish kind of um, uh, way of being clever that we have. Um, and so that's what I'm thinking about with that. So the humans in this novel are not, they are not doing like, it's not very thoughtful. I know that there are actual humans in the present as it exists who are more thoughtful than many of our characters, but we see that happening like socially, right? In our political worlds, we don't necessarily elect the wisest people to lead us. Um, the people with the most money who are able to invest it in technologies are not necessarily the ones who would most wisely deploy those technologies. And so it's that that I'm thinking about, because isn't it that at the end of the day that's sort of bringing about this thing that we've been calling the sixth mass extinction or some people call the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene or the Cthulhu scene or whatever. That's great uh, invoking those names. I think this is a great uh, start to our conversation, Larissa. Thank you so very much. Uh, so I think we'll move on and, and uh, I'd like to invite you to read from the second chapter of the Tiger Flu, please. Oh, sure, my pleasure. I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read a, a couple of pages from it. So this is the second chapter of the novel. It's called The Starfish Groom. Uh, and we're gonna meet a, a second, there's two main characters. We're gonna meet the second one. Uh, her name's Kirilo Groundsel. Uh, she's born into a place called Grist Village in the fourth quarantine ring. So it's four layers out from Saltwater City. The node or the month is Colonel Plump. It's the first day. And this is quite, um, this character is quite kooky. Um, so listen well, read my reader friends, for uh, the deep, the deep strangeness of, of this character. Even if she is our last doubler, I don't want Auntie Radix to have Peristrophe Halliana's eyes. Auntie Radix already took Peristrophe Halliana's liver a week ago, and one of her kidneys four weeks before that. Auntie Raddick says that it is the duty and nature of a starfish to give. I tell her it is the duty and nature of a doubler to know when to stop asking. Peristrophe Halliana and I have seen the new monsoons only 19 times each. We are barely old enough to do what we do. Auntie Raddick has been uh, drenched by the rains 48 times. It should be her job to sacrifice for us and not the other way round. It's a good thing that memory is not a part of the body that can be cut out, or no doubt she would ask for Peristrophe Halliana's memory too. I bite back my resentment. Radix Bupluri is our queen, 
not to mention the eldest of the 83 sisters who live at Grist Village and a direct descendant of Grandma Chan Ling. She is well past a healthy age for childbearing, but she is also our last doubler. With our death rates, we Grist sisters go the way of the dodo, unless she keeps birthing puppies. Yes, from her midnight egg space and pop, out her who, once plump and fresh, now floppy as an old sock. Still juicy to her young groom, who loves her. For me, nothing about her is juicy. Everything is duty. That means grit and grin through every whim and tantrum. I sigh. I clean, then sharpen my knives on my precious whetstone. Don't you know that diamonds are a girl's best friend? We made the whetstone ourselves, crushed so many engagement rings from skeletons of the time before, six glass towers full of nice ladies, sweet, so sweet. Purdy, the scavenger aunties tell me, purdy as cover girl, wonderful wonder bra, guess, by George Marciano. Purdy and thin as skin and bones. They had time to work off the weight, time to rot, time to mummify. For every season, there is a reason. Off their skinny dead fingers, the scavenger aunties took their diamonds, crushed those doggies to a coarse salt and made me my whetstone. Now I smooth my blade, one, two, three. All that love from the time before rushes into my shiv. That's the way the cookie crumbles, I tell my beloved peristrophe Halliana as I work my knives. Once they are good and sharp, I wipe them down with mother moonshine. We make it ourselves in clawfoot tubs from the time before, with potatoes cropped from our own fields. You know, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? We pretty maids, we sister grist, some call us tub puppets, fuck moppets, matchstick monkeys. Who cares? We will outlive them all in beds of our own making. As I prepare my knives, I rant the chant the grannies gave me, the one that Grandma Chunling heard from the dirt so long ago. My mother double, glory bind groundsel, smoking medicinal marijuana in the old rosewood pipe she inherited from Grandma Chunling herself, chants with me to make sure I get the words right. She teaches me my genealogy, you know, like where we came from, what we're here for. You must hold these things, Kirilo, she tells me. We hold all that remains of the old world's knowledge in our raw brains. That means we need to be extra smart. She teaches me how to be a good groom to my beloved Peristrophe Halliana, the last starfish among us, the last giver. It isn't easy, you know, to have and to hold, to kiss and to cut. Slit sluts, that's what they call us in Saltwater City. I'm not ignorant, I know what they say. It's why they expelled our grannies 80 years ago, for having and holding, for slicing and stitching. What did they expect from us anyhow? that they could keep making us again and again and again and again, bust us from their greasy bottles like so many cheap jean genies, as if. Grandma Chunling invented the partho pop, you know, how we egg ourselves along. I mean, the long lizardy love of the Grist sisters. We split, we slit, we heal, we groom self-mutated beyond the know-how of the clone company Gemini that spawned us and the host scale and microchip factories that bought our grannies to work for them. But there are flaws in our limited DNA, the DNA of just one woman. We mutate for better and worse for sickness and health, but more for sickness and worse. Only our starfish can save us by regrowing whatever grooms like me cut out of them. Grandma Chunling invented the kiss cut, the repair job, what do you say, the fix, the patch. The first starfish gave her liver, her kidneys, and at last her red hot heart to the first doubler. And so it was in the beginning. I chant loud as I can to push down the dread that roils in my belly. Our mother of milk and mildew, our mother of dirt, 
our mother of songs and sighing, our mother of elk. Blessed are the sheep and blessed are the roses. Blessed are the tigers, wind, bones, and onion flowers. We remember you and we remember rain. We remember mushrooms holding the globe in their mycorrhizal net. We remember dust, we remember meat. We remember fiber in its weave and fiber in its weft, the shifting and wobbling of the intentional earth. So there's a very gross scene that follows, but I will leave Kirilo there. Thank you, Larissa, for that uh, second reading from uh, The Tiger Flu, uh, which, you know, it does quite a few things for us after the first uh, chapter. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about uh, just a bit earlier was uh, references to geography from that we know today, uh, you know, these palimpsests, uh, but there's also the, the the words that the Gris sisters say to each other, they pass down. That's another example of that echoing uh, that we might know. Uh, however, despite those aspects, there's some elements as we've just encountered that are very defamiliarizing, defamiliarizing uh, you know, maybe what Darko Suva would call uh, cognitive estrangement as the reader enters that story world. Uh, so what do you see as the role of defamiliarization in this novel. Thanks, Conrad. Um, so one of the things I feel that I've been doing pretty much all of my career is trying to center my own experience, or at least the experience of, of people who are like me, whoever you want to describe that. So Asian, women, Chinese, queer, woman, whatever. It depends on the moment, which of those I'll, I'll foreground. Um, it's always been a challenge, I think, for readers to receive because there obviously isn't a huge po reading population that, that lives at that ever shifting site. Um, and one of the things that speculative fiction does for me, of course, is it makes that possible in a way that um, realist fiction, I think, can also make it possible, but it does it differently. And there's something about spec that for me really um, opens up the possibility there to center that experience, to build worlds that make it seem normal. Um, and I think, you know, for this sort of the mainstream reader as it's understood and constructed by the Canadian publishing industry is clearly not that, right? Um, and so I feel that that's been my work for much of my career. And then with this particular book, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to deploy that skill set towards somebody who is actually quite, quite strange, somebody who doesn't actually yet exist and to write a novel, at least in part from her point of view, and just let her speak her weirdness as though it's not weird at all. Um, and so that is the work of defamiliarization, right? That is the work of, uh, of um, making, making normal um, that which to most of our readership in, inhabiting our present moment would find strange in, in, in the present moment. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing there. You know, and the other thing that, that I've been thinking about in regards to this question is um, that, uh, because there was a draft of this novel that was about three times as long, it was very, very, very long. And uh, the feedback that I had largely got from editors and friends on that one is that, you know, it's too long, there's too much world building, there's too much telling, uh, how can you pick up the pace? Um, and I sort of realized that, you know, it's that to tell, the narrative from a straighter place requires a lot of language that people don't necessarily want to hear. And so I was also aiming for a kind of concision and to do this work of both familiarizing and defamiliarizing at the same time was one way of, 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 of making it much tighter and much more concise. Of course, it takes people for a wild ride, right? And that's, I mean, a lot of the feedback that's been coming is, whoa, that was very strange. I'm like, oh yes, indeed it was, thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, you just get a lot of info dump, right? What's the all well, the writers call info dump? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'd love to read that uh, three times as long draft one day, maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, this, you know, <laughs> you speak to the uh, this defamiliarization and you know this alterity, another word we might uh, throw out that that uh, idea. Uh, so you've got things, you know, like this history as SF writing, there's cyberpunk, right? You know, cyberpunkishness. We talked about the satellite mainframes and uh, you, you mentioned in the reading with Cora, the, the tendril information scales, I think, uh, where she's accessing knowledge or not accessing knowledge, sort of in a William Gibson-esque way, perhaps. But I really also like the 
biopunk, what I'll call biopunk at least, aspects of the novel. Uh, so an example of this is the uh, batter kite air vehicle that we haven't encountered yet uh, that will be coming, and there's several others. Uh, to me, these feel like really refreshing and fascinating additions to this larger SF uh, genre, or speculative fiction as you, you've put it, uh, which fits under that umbrella, I would say. Uh, so can you say a bit more about your process and folding in futuristic biological elements? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Conrad. And you're right. There's elements of both, right? There's elements of both biopunk and cyberpunk. I think there, you know, there's a subtle critique of sort of the cyberpunk mode at work in this novel, um, because I think cyberpunk very much depends on an embrace of the mind body split, um, which is, a, you know, a, an, an inheritance from the European enlightenment. Not all cultures imagine, um, imagine such a split as a, an existing thing that can be inhabited. Um, and so you have that with, with the upload to Chang, right? That only those who believe in the split can go up there and imagine that they have a life. Uh, but I don't wanna to give too much away. So for sure the biopunk side of things is more where my sympathies lie. Um, and I am indeed interested in things like synthetic biologies, you know, DNA manipulation. Um, the recognition that us, we meddling monkeys, we human beings um, are going to in interfere in the body as indeed, you know, we are living through so many sort of reverberative layers of that um, manipulation in the present moment and understanding of the body as a machine, right? But again, one, one has to inhabit. And I think it's th that inhabitation element that we were talking about earlier that maybe differentiates bio, biopunk. Well, that's not true. Cyberpunk also imagines a kind of inhabitation. Just think about Neo running around in the matrix, right? I take that back. They're both, they're both about inhabitation, but biopunk allows us to continue to inhabit some remnant of the body as it, as it, um, as it evolves both naturally and through our, um, through our, inter our interference and their sort of reverberative um, evolution that unfolds um uh between those two those two modes of action which one might argue are actually um of which, which are actually one might argue are uh what's that for like um elements of the same um the same unfolding hu humans as animals as part of part of nature i guess is what i mean there um so in relation to the batter kite and the tendril scales and other sort of um bio punky elements tropes at work in the novel. The batter kite in particular was a lot of fun to write. I had read an article, I think it was in Scientific American, I can't remember now to be honest, but you know, one of those sort of popular kind of science um, magazines that, you know, helps non-scientists like me who are nonetheless interested in what goes on, think about these kinds of things. It was an article on biological batteries and the possibility of growing like the article was about growing them, you know, to be about the size of a, of a double A or something like that. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could grow a battery that was at the same time could be like an airship because the world, so I was thinking about the Hindenburg, I was thinking about the blimp, right? Another obs obsolete technology, in other words, that um, could come back, but come back a little bit differently. So what if we could grow a battery that was actually massive and would run on its own batteriness as a ship at the same time. I was trying to think about, you know, like how are people going to get around in this world? Like if there's no more petroleum, right? Then no, and no more cars and no more airplanes, then how are people going to get around? And, you know, the return to the blimp would be one way, but I was like, well, there's been so much bioengineering in this world, you know, like Curie Lowe and the Grist sisters uh, are, um, essentially escaped. They're not escape experiments. They're, they're two generations down escapees from a cloning company who have figured out how to continue to evolve in directions that are of use and interest to them. Um, so that's what Kiri Lowe does, right? As she is one of these meddling, meddling primates, an interferer in the bio, her own biology and that of her sisters. Um, and the batter kite, likewise, is a you know a, a sort of a figure of this of this this changed world in which biological technologies are that much further down the track, 
and people are able to grow different kinds of things, including different kinds of machines. And so that's that's what the batter that's what the batter kite that's what the batter kite is. And then the tendril scales, likewise, they're a sort of a combo bio, a combo bio cyberpunk thing where you can stick. So I'm imagining that pri privatization continues, right? So and for anybody who has lost contact with Chang or Eng and can't access the, the uh, internet anymore, it's a way of enhancing um, knowledge access because they can't read anymore. So there's technologies as well that could potentially perfectly well serve people, but they've lost it as we you know, do in our present moment, right? Um, so many fewer people read now than, than used to. So they plug the tendril scale into the head instead to get the information drop. Yeah, I, I think that's for me where the, the connection, but also difference with you know Gibson uh, came because there's those th things that plug into the back of the skull perhaps in uh, Neuromancer. But I like how you talked about that uh, critique of uh, cyberpunk, you know, uh, I think it, we just mentioned Neuromancer. So uh, Case himself uh, is very disconnected from his body, you know, and mm -hmm. so this this connection with the body, with the, the biology, is very important with this biopunk. I think the batter kite is my favorite <laughs> aspect that you included in the novel, to be honest. Uh, so just to, to move along further with that, uh, you know, I wonder about your choices with references to flora and fauna. So given some of the names of the characters. Uh, specifically, I'm wondering if there's a connection to the Cascadia re region with these names of uh, flora and fauna, how much they reflect the future change of the area, or do they not do that? Uh, so where did you, how did you come to these names, these references to flora and fauna? Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Conrad. That's a really great question. So there's a number of things going on in this novel with flora and fauna. Um, and as I said, I, I did quite intensively, you know, research um, space and place and uh, climate change. And I did think about the ways in which the weather would change with the climate and what kinds of changes that might affect in the bioregion that um, one of the bioregions that I've spent a large part of my life in, which would be the Cascadia re region. And so some of the plants and animals, you know, continue to exist there. Um, and then I also did quite a bit of research on flora and fauna from sort of what are present day Oregon and Oregon and um, California, because I imagine that as, um, as the climate changes, as the world warms, that um, species uh, um, would migrate, would migrate. And so you'll get, you know, Salal beside um, uh, uh, Pinyon, um, which we don't currently have a whole heck of a lot. Of, a, 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 there's not a heck of a lot of Pinyon in the Cascadia region right now, like maybe up around like Kamloops and stuff like that, because it's so arid there, and there might be, but I'm imagining more of that dryness and the characters do, do cross through that, through that space. Um, so that's one thing that's going on. I imagine the monsoon, for instance, migrating um, and hitting the Cascadia region in a way which it does not now, and the se seasons being much more governed by monsoon than they currently are. So things like that I'm thinking of. Um, the Grist sisters are also, they have plant names and um, sort of some of my science readers will probably uh, have a little bit of a sense of that, but they're not named for um, um, plants of that region because I'm thinking of them as Chinese, right? So they, their names are um, the Latin names for Chinese traditional herbs, or in some cases I've sort of mixed and matched. But I've often thought that, you know, when you look at the little box of yin chow of Nankyo, which is a, a cold remedy, um, and you look at the Latin names and they sound so much like the names. So it was just a whimsical thing on my part, you know, to sort of give them the, give them the names of the, of the herbs on various boxes of Chinese medicinals, because. They sound, I, I just like the way they sound. I like that they're a little bit, they're, 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 they're Latin words, right? So like they're, they're Latin, they're Latinatenessness. And, um, uh, and I like the strange, I, li I liked the strangeness of the sound. It somehow sort of seemed to jive with the kinds of, um, the, their way of being in the world, like a little, they're a little bit nerdified, 
Um, but they're also doing pretty weird bodily things with their nerdiness. They're not all up in their heads because they're, they're also into the body. Um, and so that was a, that was a whimsy, that was a whimsy thing. Uh, uh, for me. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you, Larissa, for answering that question. Uh, I'll have to look for the Kamloops reference. I'm actually from, uh, I was born in Kamloops, so I'll have to find that in the book. I, I didn't notice that one. Uh, I don't think I, I don't think I named it. So that was just off the top of my head just now, sort of thinking about the dryness of that region. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sort of into the territory because I'm living in Calgary now, which is very, very arid. And I've done that drive, you know, along the one between Vancouver and Calgary so many hundreds of times. And just yeah. to watch the landscape suddenly change from a very wet rainforest yeah. landscape to here where it's, you know, not quite, but very nearly almost desert, so dry with the Chinook yeah. wind going through. And just thinking about how, um, you know, we get a lot of those, oh, what are those kinds of pines called where the needles are so long, oh, right? And especially if you go, like you take the other route and you go through the Coots, sort of the Southern route. Yeah. Um, and up around um, Kootenai Lake in particular, you drive down the lake, you get all the range of changes yeah. with different kinds of plants, um, including those kinds of trees that are so common in California, not the redwoods, um, the, the, the shorter ones that still have the sort of bundly, the bundly. Is it pine or no, I imagine that. I can't remember, maybe. Yeah. Can't remember. I do know, I'd like, I've researched it before, but it's not in my head. Yeah. I need Need a tendril scale, Conrad. Yeah, yeah, there you go. This actually fits with my next question, funnily enough. Uh, and a, a bit of a spoiler alert, but uh, since the narrative ends in the place that is said to be on Kainai or Blood Tribe land, uh, and it's flanked on the other side by, you know, Pentahicton, uh, you know, and the Vancouver, or whatever we want to call it, Lower Mainland now, I'm wondering if the original village of the Grist Sisters is set somewhere in the Kootenays or elsewhere. Uh, and then how did you choose where to situate both of the Grist Village versions? Right, right, right. So always in all of my fictions, you know, there's a, I'm gonna trail this way, way back to something that seems like it's not connected and I promise I'll connect it. So early days when I started writing, and I, but I think this is still a thing that happens to young, especially young writers of color now, and indigenous writers as well. There's so much pressure on the autobiograph autobiographical to tell your life in this traumatized abject kind of way as your ticket of entry into getting to be a writer at all in this country. It's still such a phenomenon. Drives me crazy. I recognized it when I was very, very young because the pressure, pressure was so acute and so intense. And um, you know, I have as much of a reason of wanting to protect my own privacy as anybody else, right? And so refused to do it in early days, which I think is partly how I end up in the peculiar career formation that I that I that I have um, by refusing to do that. But um, there's always in in pretty much every single thing that I've written actually an autobiographical element of some kind. It's just not overt. Um, and so in this one, it's for sure it's that trail. It's a trail between Vancouver and Calgary as two cities that I've spent, you know, I've lived in that are home to me in different kinds of ways um, and the, the route between them. And so I'm thinking about those spaces and those places and all of these places are places that I've moved through. Um, so the locating of Grist Village in particular, I figure it's somewhere around Beaverdale probably, um, imagined different. So I did a lot of research on the Kettle Valley Railway uh, just kind of thinking about, you know, the Chinese Canadian railway connection as well. Although I don't think that they, that there were Chinese workers on that particular stretch, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a loose nod to that. Um, and I also wanted it to sort of be cool and treat enough for the kind of environment that Kirilo is, is inhabiting, um, and a place where there's caves, um, yeah. And so that was what that was about. And then to, to put um, the, to end the novel on Gaina territory, um, of course, is much closer to where I'm actually living right now. And so not that Kirilo and I are the same person by any stretch of the imagination. I do not cut people's eyeballs out. <laughs> um, but uh, just to have, it was my way, I guess, of recognizing, you know, the land, the lands that I've that I've lived on and moved through, and 
to express gratitude in my own slightly peculiar way. Oh, Conrad, have you frozen? Hear you or see you. I think Conrad, okay, you're, back. Oh, oh, you're back now. You're back, you're back. Phew. Oh. I was a little, okay. little scared. I'm not sure if it was me or you. <laughs> I saw you freeze on my screen, but maybe okay. I saw yours. Yeah, you did. did. Ah, Sorry about that. Not at all. I think we're all good. I don't know if the audience caught everything that I said about, did you catch everything that I said about? It, it, it was fine, yes. I think uh, Conrad, has, Conrad was frozen for a second. Okay, well, I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, now we are good. Okay, uh, well, uh, sorry for missing the, that part, uh, Larissa. I guess I'll just uh, circle back with another question. Uh, I wanna talk about the Grist sisters for a moment. Um, they, there is a, as a community, I'm sorry? Well, I was just going to say, I can repeat myself if you didn't hear me, just so that you're, you're into the conversation with everyone else. I just, so I closed off with just sort of saying, you know, it was a nod to the territories that I've lived on and moved through and my own peculiar way of expressing gratitude to the times and places and peoples um, whose lands I've, I've lived on or crossed through. That's wonderful. Thank you for answering that question, Larissa. And I'm sorry about the technological <laughs> problem there, as we always experience problems, uh, even in the novel, right? <laughs> There's technological problems. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I was going to ask a question next about uh, the Grist sisters. Uh, so as a community, they, they persist through a couple of different processes, which you've already uh, hinted at, even in your readings. Uh, one of these is the ability to of some to regrow organs and therefore to donate them to other community members. Uh, another is through parthenogenic reproduction. Uh, you've already addressed this a bit, but uh, how do you see these as addressing the potentiality of the future? The, you know, this idea of uh, potential, I guess, is where I'm getting at. Sure. Yeah, sure. So I am indeed thinking about, you know, some of the technologies and processes that are available to us in the present moment, like. For instance, it's possible now to grow chicken meat without the chicken. It's possible to transplant humanized pig organs into human beings, right? It's possible to grow mice that whose um, immune systems mimic human immune systems. Like it's possible to do so many amazing kind of whack things. And we've been talking about the ethics of such things for a long, long time. Um, I think particularly for me, the marker is Dolly the sheep, the cloning of Dolly the sheep yeah. and the capacity for cloning, um, which I think I'm thinking about a lot in, um, in uh, Saltfish Girl. Um, so, and I mean, one of the things that's happening with the tiger flu was I, I realized I hadn't finished thinking about cloning as a technology. It's quite an old technology now, um, yeah. but I hadn't finished thinking about its potentialities. Um, and so when the tiger flu, the tiger flu was initially you know, that was the initial impulse was, oh my gosh, I didn't finish thinking about it in Saltfish Girl. And, you know, the village that they all end up, the village of clones that they all end up in at the end of Saltfish Girl. I'm like, this village of clones is an amazing place. I want to think about it more. And so part of the impetus for the tiger flu was that. Um, the other thing that's going on though, Conrad, that we haven't really spoken about is um, I've for a long time been really interested in and inspired by um, this sort of second wave feminist spec fic movement that includes people like, you know, Ursula Le Guin and Marge Piercy and Joanna Russ and that sort of whole kind of uh, late 60s into the 70s. Um, well, right up to, I mean, Octavia Butler as well, who's writing into the 80s. Um, but so this second wave feminist rolling into the third wave way of thinking about feminism and there's certain aspects of second wave feminism in particular that I just have a, a soft spot for even though they've become really dated and nobody does this anymore um, and so for instance thinking about Joanna Russ's lesbian separatism right and the whole explosion of sort of women's lands that that um, that were um, a, a, a serious political thing in the 60s and 70s. There was such a sad article, and I think it was a New York Times, I don't know, a year or two ago, about how these women's lands have gone begging for um, uh, women to go and live on them now, because the idea of woman itself is shifting. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it was a sort of nostal whimsical nostalgia for the moment of those novels um, and the feminist utopias that uh, those writers imagined. 
And so in another way, my Grist sisters are that. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, right, there's so much discussion around what they were calling the new reproductive technologies. And in fact, my mom was a little bit involved in um, some, of the, some of the work around thinking through the ethics of, of that. And so I'm still kind of carrying that around as, you know, thinking about, okay, well, if we really want a re um, you know, feminism to continue to be a thing, if we're really down on the heteropatriarchy, must we, must the nuclear family be the thing that it must be? And I think the answer for many of us who have lived through queer culture for, you know, a number of generations has been, no, of course not, right? Um, and then, so with the Grist sisters, I'm thinking about, I was thinking about that. It's like, okay, well, what if there was this community of women who could actually self-reproduce? Because that's one of the big questions, right? That comes up, for instance, in Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time. It's like, oh, well, we just have these brooders, you know, and then all the kids need to be born out of the brooder. The stuff is whack, like it's totally whack and it's so fabulous and nobody talks about it anymore. And so I wanted to start talking about it again because I love it and it makes me laugh. And I, it's, I think, it, but I think it's also serious and it's great. And, uh, and so that's what I'm doing with the Gris sisters. And I'm like, okay, well, how are they going to reproduce if there are indeed no men in this world? And um, surely that possibility must be there. Uh, and so I'm imagining, okay, well, what if it's escaped clones? And then how are they going to do it? And you, so that's how the parthenogenesis comes about. It's like, surely such things can be possible. There are animals that do this, you know, worms and fish mostly at, at present. But, but why not? Um, and so that's what I'm thinking about there. So it's partly about the technological possibility, but it's also thinking about, you know, feminist social thought and kind of trying to join those things, join those things up in a slightly whimsical kind of way. And Great, the other- thing. Oh, sorry. Two, oh, sorry. I'll just say one last quick thing is not wanting to make it too lovely because we're not lovely to one another in our communities. Right. But sometimes that unloveliness is out of necessity. So I built the necessity into the fictional biology of these figures. You're probably thank watching. You. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, unfortunately, I think we should move forward, but thank you for those uh, wonderful uh, answers, thoughtful answers to uh, uh, the tiger flu. Uh, so we'll switch gears now, if that's okay with you, Larissa. And I'll ask you to read a couple excerpts from uh, your newest book of poetry, uh, Iron Goddess of Mercy. Sure, sure. Thank you Thank so you. much, Conrad. And thanks for keeping us on, on time track wise. On track Everyone told me I had to. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a worry. You know what? I think I'm just going to, I think I told you I'd read four. I'll just read three um, just to be a little bit time conscious. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now to read from a very, very different book called Iron Goddess of Mercy, which um, just came out earlier this year. Um, it's, a, it's a long poem. The language is very experimental. So listeners are going to hear some weird language. Just try not to worry about meaning too much is what I would say to you. And then the first pass, just open the ear and let the language and let the language flow and don't stress if you can't follow what the heck is she talking about. Uh, so I'll start with the 51st one. So there's 64 fragments in this novel. I'll start with number 51. Dear Oolong, if there were no such thing as tea, none of this would have happened. Bone, gukbo, hengpin, lung ching, or ti kun yam, I hum, infusions, a solution to remaining alert to irony as sleepers puff opium, trading the doozy of drowsiness for the carrot of charity, draining the oort cloud of our distant origins. Alert in the iron box, Tempest teases schoolyard bullies flipping their hair like fara. Mine's too flat to feather. Birds gather in conferences, unable to backcomb for the stand-up comedian or punk rock pork hawk. My dialect ditzes for the fetal leaf, unfurling in hot water as English breakfast, Russian caravan, Prince of Wales, or Earl and Lady Grey. I hack for smack heroin, morphine, or crack, as Jardine Mathis implies the China trade, pirating porcelain, silk, cotton, and tea, items of use traded for the inducement of rest. That's okay. I'll dream my way back into your loving arms race, Cold War or Trade War, parading handbags from Prada, Coach, and Chanel as students toss Molotov cocktails against tear gas 
on the MTR. Our scars glisten bright as stars fishing for birds in the Silver River, a sliver of memory flashing light on our, on our addictions enforced by gunboat diplomacy, while geomancers crack ox scapula for a route out of psychic unrest. What metal could test this? Gunpowder green or iron goddess as my fireworks go up in smoke. I poke for a new Berlin, find a cross on the road as fentanyl crisis boom echoes across centuries of artificial sleep. Perturbed galaxy ejects, tidal stream of stars, river jumps fish. Excuse me. Dear silence, this is number 52. Dear silence, traveling as a kind of love, you protect the innocent from the injuries of the harmed, alarmed by violation the heart can't count. What the soldier did to her, I was so unhappy then. If I tell you, it will be as though I let him cut you too. I don't want to wield that knife, the strife of repetition confirming my perdition. Dear cut, dear beheading, dear 10,000 women, what Iris witnessed killed her. The old ones don't know the talking cure. What if my therapist's avatar doesn't work on the people of Tang Street, the ones who crossed the mountains leaving their dynasty 10,000 years behind? What if it's only for one God cultures of confession, the absent present people of the on off switch and the lesson of my species leaves me in the dirt? For folks who ching circular on the how of Tao, what's left after I tell? I blink in the zero one of the whole and broken line. If I speak my hush, what world will whirl back to me? Will 10,000 flowers bloom or will the violets of violence boom me back to a jar of hot oil without arms, without legs, without eyes, sightless pig of obliteration sunk and scalded in hatred's imagination, deep as the lurch of my tentative love the one I don't dare lest it bind you too. It's better to be Canadian, dance the nutcracker of ballerina beauty, white as an Eastern snowstorm, so close you can't see your hand. Woman emperor, intrigued by North Star, a line spine to crack back. And I'll just read the very last one, which is number 64. Dear Dow, old rotary, turtle shell squeal whistling in flames to name the hell of a revolutionary god. I split my cod, debone at spine to line a whispered history. Astronauts impossible labor climbs back down millennia, returns to earth. The E of Ching blusters to Shang ancestry, priestess geomancer of a bad romance. I'll take a chance on democracy from below, glowing in the slow heat of an other ember. Guilt shines beneath quilt of magpies flashing shimmery feathers as Protestant lies down on her bed of nails, dials dialectic for that long distance feeling, beguiled by the gush of blood staining the shroud of her own making. What king could ding this, melt dragons in cauldrons to brew a better soup? I stoop, loop Yue for Teen Hao, Gun Yum for ocean goers, Avalo Kitishvera of the long march across deserts, Bodhisattva of water, queen mother of a different west, rescues father and brothers from massive spiral sea to sky storm. Now her incense coil burns above, snakes from wet temple, steps from station of the cross. We were not yet Chinese when Shang was ancient. I dream my being returned to Weaver's once and future North Star. Dear Tong Yun, I pilot my ship on South China Sea, blink my split toenail, cast net for wishes, bungle my smuggle for a pot of rice steamed with salted fish. Echo wagers cap against standard, Hughes pool table to return love's body in remembered alphabets, lunar pull. So there's just a little fragment of that. It's a very different project, obviously. Um, but there's crossover if one looks, I think. Definitely, thank you for uh, reading uh, 
some of the excerpts from this uh, this poem, Iron Goddess of Mercy. It's a, um, you know, it's been commented uh, in other places and in interviews that you've done uh, that it's epistolary uh, and echoes the haibon form, prose and haiku, that is an opening and reply format, I think. Um, but I'm actually interested in the macro structure of the book, which uh, is a long poem. It literally says on the cover that it's Iron Goddess of Mercy, a poem. Um, so are there particular influences behind your choice of the long poem verses, or perhaps here as a collection of poems? Sure, yeah, sure, Conrad, thank you. It's a great question. Um, so there's a long tradition of the long poem in Canada, I think especially out here on the West Coast, West yeah. Coast, or Western regions, depending on how you want to understand Calgary. <laughs> Um, and for sure, I mean, I'm thinking about Fred Waz Diamond Grill, right? He was um, was and is a dear friend and teacher. Um, also, his mother, father, Haibun, in Waiting for Saskatchewan. So there's also a, a history of that form uh, taken up by by Wa, by Kika. I'm also thinking about B.P. Nichols' Martyrologies. One other dear friend of mine, Roy Miki, um, was, was good friends with B.P. and also a, a scholar of, of Beeps. Um, I guess the long poem in a lot of ways goes back to that not a fan, um, but in some ways still a fan pound, right? And, and his cantos. Uh, I don't obviously embrace the same politics, just to be very, very clear. Um, so yeah, that's the deal with, with the long poem. It's a form, you know, that's been kind of um, practiced out here for a long time, and I wanted to try my hand at it. Um, and I think also for this poem, you know, that there are certain elements of the long poem that are really important. So the sort of sequential kind of paratactic uh, capabilities of that form are really important for me. So in other words, the sense that um, the sense of accrual, right, and the reliance on the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of elements and their accrual over time, I think are really, really important. So, so those are some of the reasons why I take up the long poem. Thank you. Uh, I like how you sort of put the, the history of long poem in terms of writing to, but also writing against certain uh, voices. Uh, I think I'll sort of mash together my next set of two questions here. Uh, one is about the different voices that thread through the book and what drove you to write in these voices. And there's several voices. And then the, the acknowledgments at the end, you reference a uh, peopled palimpsest, quote unquote, that Iron Goddess sometimes overwrites and sometimes uplifts. Uh, so can you say more about these influences? I guess they're very uh, similar questions in the end, uh, the voices yeah. and the influences. Sure, yeah, I know the two questions are related for sure. So with this particular project, I mean, it speaks to the tiger flu in some ways as well. I was indeed listening for voices in the first instance. That's pretty much always the way that I start a project. It seems to be what works for me is opening the ear and listening for voices. So I guess I'm one of those writers that, you know, doesn't believe in writerly genius, even kind of sort of at all, that, that whole notion of the writer, you know, the lonely writer in the garret, um, exercising a form of genius does not pertain. And instead, what I'm doing is I'm listening for the things that I hear. And in a sense, waiting for the arrival, I'm waiting, right? I think my job as a writer is primarily to wait and to listen. And so I'm waiting to hear the voice that's resonant for me. And that's that's really the case with both books. Um, and in, in this one, the voice, the voices, there's many, many more of them, and they're much more disparate. Or in the Tiger Flu, it's really in, in many ways Kirillo's voice, you know, that's kind of holding that one up and holding it together in a lot of ways. Um, whereas in the I Iron Goddess, there's so many you can't even count them. Um, so the Iron Goddess, the voice of the iron, the voice of the Iron Goddess is in another way I like to think about it is it's maenadic, you know, they're, they're maenads, they're furies, who are just like, whoa, like talking this, I'm mad about this, I'm mad about that, I curse you, or I pray for you, um, but there's so many of them, and um, I'm just allowing them to enter as I hear them, um, and so in terms of the thing driving me, um, you know, these last couple few years in the midst of the Trump presidency down south, but also in the midst of the dumpster fire in Canadian literature over the past four, five, six, seven, eight years. And then also with the thing that in Canada we haven't been paying attention to a lot, but my family has, um, is the, the, the death of democracy in Hong Kong and what the PRC is doing in there. 
Um, so many things profoundly upsetting and I've been feeling profoundly upset. But then I'm also aware that the upset that I've been feeling personally is not mine and mine alone, right? So I'm sort of thinking in affective terms in a lot of ways and that the, the feelings that are rolling through my body are the feelings that people, everyone around me is feeling in different kinds of ways, depending on the kind of body that one is given, the way it looks, how one is inhabiting all the things we've been talking about already. And um, yeah, so Iron Goddess is the one that just, that just came, you know, sort of through opening the door of a certain upset, a kind of an affect of rage and despair. Um, and then listening to the voices and that's how I get them. And that's why there's so many. And that, so that's why one of the major figures moving through this book as well as the figure of the main ads of the Furies who are multiple and not entirely human and vengeful and angry. Thank you. That's a very emotional subject to, to talk about. Um, uh, you know, uh, I guess then I'm wondering, you know, between poetry and prose, uh, is there one that you feel more poignant in addressing the crises and issues of the current moment? Are they both, uh, you know, just as effective, but from different uh, angles? Uh, do the different modes accomplish particular effects that hold value for you in addressing the things that are, uh, you know, are driving you right? You know, driving you right. Right, right. I think they both they do it in different ways, Conrad. So if I were to say one thing, I would say, you know, the poetry is probably closer to the body in a lot of ways. Fiction, because it's, it's such a conservative form. Of course, both are structured, um, but I think fiction allows a lot less room for, for form. And then uh, at this, by the same token, I'm really aware that more people read fiction it's more commercial and it's more accessible and it circulates. More people read it, like infinitely more, yeah. right? So I think that they do different kinds of things. I sort of think of poetry as the poetry that's closer to the body, that's sort of more true in some ways, but it's also harder to read and fewer people are trained to read it. Not that, not that I think we have to be trained, but I think people think that they can't read it and then they don't. I actually think that anybody can read it and if they would, that they would receive what they need to receive from this book. But people don't know that. And they read it and then it doesn't mean anything. And so, um, and then they're like, I don't wanna read it, right? That we're living in a moment where we've been taught to consume and we're really, really good at consuming and fiction is what is consumable. Um, it's, it seems to us to be easier. Um, and so, yeah. And so I suppose it's that they do different things. There's sort of different relationship to audiences and readers and through the two genres. And the fiction has to be combed and structured and edited um, much more intensely. And I think in so doing, it loses it more, but it also reaches more. Thank you. That's uh, very astute <laughs> observations of how people perceive poetry and perceive fiction. Uh, in Iron Goddess, you actually have echoes uh, back to uh, your past things. One of these echoes is this concept of the long now that you uh, bring back, which at the very least emerged with civil unrest with Rita Wong, a previous book. Uh, so I was just wondering if, uh, have the messages of this terminology changed for you with Iron Goddess and what does it mean to invoke the idea of the long now over a decade later? Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I think when I was working on civil unrest with Rita, you know, it was that the bulk of that novel was written right after the millennium term turned. And I think we, there were certain things we were thinking of, you know, we were thinking about climate change. We were thinking about, we were thinking about the both the globe and the planet. We were thinking about global warming. We were thinking about global the global finance. But we were also, I think both of us, you know, come from um, a long standing history of community, community grounded organizing, that kind of work that some people call activism. I'm uncomfortable with that term. I don't really think of myself as an activist, and I don't think Rita does either, although I would think of her as an activist, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but for sure, or the organize, organizing work. And so, and, and in that sense, connection with people and with the land in a, in a way that I hope is attentive. And so for me and for her, I think in that moment, the long now is that. 
Um, there's this thing called the Clock of the Long Now, uh, which is run by Society of the Clock of the Long Now, who are inviting us, interestingly, to think, right, in geological terms that the present is long, but that, we're, that are we still as humans, um, you know, uh, very much impinge upon and shape that present. And so that is, we were thinking about that, I think, in the moment of civil unrest. I think in the present moment that now in a lot of ways has come clo it's closer and it's more everything that was there in our consciousness then has become so much more urgent now, right? In the aftermath of Trump, in the thick of COVID, um, when who knows what the heck is going to happen with the economy when, you know, the intensification of capital, like I'm not even sure that we're living in neoliberalism anymore now, or if there's another political form that's unfolding where in the moment of civil unrest, that was like the, the height of the neoliberal moment. And I don't know what moment is emerging now. So everything now feels more urgent, more tentative, harder to describe. And yet the necessity of our agents, of human agency, what little agency we have, but also what massive agency we have. So the, both the slightness of it and the massiveness of it are more present now than ever. And I would say that the long now and that sense of living, you know, in a moment that's geological remains. And yet there's something very immediate and emergent and, uh, and urgent in our present that I don't think we were feeling. It's about feeling at the end of the day, right? It's not that any of the issues were less present then, but I think we're feeling them more acutely now, maybe. That's how I would think about that, Conrad. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for answering that. And uh, it does seem that so many issues are uh, the features here now, rather than we have to be concerned about the future coming tomorrow or you know, even the next day. Uh, and this importance of cultural organizing. I wonder, you know, perhaps our goddess itself is with its main ed voices, its, its multiplicity speaking to uh, the fact that uh, these issues are so urgent, are so now, or are so. Uh, difficult and frustrating and uh, angering even, perhaps. This is uh, about being with people. Sorry, Ursula, what'd you say? It's about, it's about being with people yeah. and also with non-human others. So that sense of relationality, I think, has become more pressing than ever. But also we're registering just how incredibly difficult it is. And Iron Goddess is registering that difficulty. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this honor uh, and for your thoughtful answers. Uh, I think we have to move on to the question period at this point, uh, given the time. We're a little bit over uh, what I was told I, we should end at. And as Emma has put into the chat box, this is for everyone, uh, there's time for some Q&A. Uh, so if you have questions, you can write in the text box and I will try to parse them for Larissa or she can add to them if she sees them. Uh, or you can do the raise the hand option, uh, though I'm not sure I see anybody myself. So maybe. A, uh, Emra, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, yeah, now the floor is open for like questions or comments. So if you want really, I, I mean, just there's the option raise hand. So if you use that option, I can immediately make your calls. Just feel free to make a comment or, or write on the chat box. Maybe until we are waiting uh, from people to hear, I may ask one uh, question in terms of maybe categorization, if it is a fine Larissa to you, like, because I think in your, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks so much for this wonderful uh, conversation. My question would be uh, in terms of this uh, dichotomy between utopia and dystopia, like should we think of utopia and dystopia as separate categories or as an entangled relationship? And how do you see, or like they believe in strict categorizations or taxonomies when it comes to, for example, now, I think in academia, we are uh, separating this like now, cli fi I think pandemic fiction, utopia and dystopia. Do you believe such strict uh, categorizations should exist or no? Should we just like ignore these categorizations? Thank you. Thank you, Emra. It's a, that's a really, really excellent question and a difficult question. You know, and I would say that, especially in spec fiction studies, we've been so, um, so hell-bent on our nomenclatures, haven't we? Sometimes at the expense of the actual work, I think. Um, and I do believe that to be true, and I do believe that to be a problem. 
But I don't think that necessarily means that the nomenclatures are bad or that we, should, we, we should, be, should be throwing out the terminology because I think the terminology is useful. Um, I, you know, I mean, I'm thinking that um, in terms of thinking of utopia and dystopia as pure sites of any kind. So utopia as a place that we might actually arrive at, I think is foolish. I also think that, that dystopia as a place we might actually arrive at is also foolish. And one of the things that I was trying to do in the tiger flu in particular is, is to think about the interactions of elements, you know, sort of to think about the ways in which both human and earth propensities, both good and bad are at work. And that as they interact, things fall out of the sack, both good and bad, because at the end of the day, the, the judgment, good and bad is human judgment, right? And in a lot of times they're also, um, they're also judgments uh, according to um, the uh, Judeo-Christian or sort of monotheistic traditions that we carry in the West. Um, and so one of the desires that I have in terms of um, injecting the Tao into the conversation, so you have that in TAO and Time After Oil, um, but also it's uh, much more sort of overtly at work in, in Iron Goddess, is I think it's really important to think about the ways in which forces interact um, and more productive to think about or all about, about them interacting in a wheel or interacting on a spiral as the Tao does or as the I Ching does and Iron Goddess is, is actively working with that, than to think about the dichotomy, the good places or bad places, right? And that that might offer us more possibility to think intelligently into the future, which indigenous people would just call time immemorial anyway, than to think in terms of good places and bad places, or even things like, you know, you have Jameson, uh, Fred Jameson, for instance, thinking about the utopian uh, enclave within the dystopia, that there's always something good that's gonna come out of what we think of as bad. Um, I think it's still hanging on to, it's hanging on to the dialectic, it's hanging on to, um, good versus evil. It's hanging on to a very kind of uh, binary, binary, binary oriented Western framework that doesn't make room for non-Western philosophies that I think could in this present moment. And this is what we hear a lot of our Indigenous friends and allies telling us as well, you know, it's why we keep talking about Indigenous epistemologies, right, is because those epistemologies allow another kind of worldview um, that I think can push us out of the kind of binary that utopia dystopia tends to want to offer. And that, that you know, in utopian studies as well, so many of the critics see it breaking down, right? So, you know, whether we're thinking about Tom Moylan or Fred Jameson or Ruth Levitas, everybody is seeing that the dichotomy doesn't work and they're looking for utopias and dystopias and dystopias and utopias or the critical utopia or, you know, right? That as soon as we set up those nomenclatures, we start, we see them breaking down anyway. Um, and that's what I think is probably the useful critical labor that needs to be unfolding now. So it's, I don't want to throw out the terms. I still think they're useful. Um, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. That's yeah. a great answer. Yes. I have a question. That's a great answer. So I have a question uh, about what do you envision as your next project from one of the listeners? It's from Anita. From, yeah, Anita. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. There are a number of projects uh, kind of in the works right now, and I, you know, I can't say which ones are going to bear fruit for sure. Um, but uh, when Conrad was asking, you know, what I did when the, when the when the pandemic first hit, I think something about the actual material and habitation of it allowed me to enter another traumatic moment that's been on my mind for a long time, but difficult to write about, which is the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong. And so I've written a novel about that. I don't know if it's gonna, well, there's a contract kind of just on the horizon. So I'm hoping it's gonna work out. Um, so that's one project. Um, I also have about a hundred pages into a sequel for the tiger flu that again, I'm not sure is gonna work out, but it's a novel about when Eng comes back. So that's another, that's another one um, that's sort of in the works. Uh, and then, I don't know, I've been getting little invitations in the last little while to contribute to um, various journals and, and, and magazines around the world. It's been really lovely to hear from people, and I do love hearing from people. And 
I love those kinds of conversations as well. So I might for the next little bit, just write, write little small things for the different people who have invited me to do things um, and, and just do that for a little bit. Uh, to sort of, you know, I'll still allow myself to think beside and with one another to sort of see what's interesting as well and to be in conversation with other people. So those are the kinds of things that are going on in my practice right now. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. The great question, Annette. Uh, we have another question that asks about what mostly inspires you to write a poem? Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that is a great question. That's a question from one of our graduate students at Cappadocia. Oh, oh wonderful. Thank you. Um, so what mostly inspires me to write a poem? Um, it depends on the moment, you know? So as I was saying in relation to Iron Goddess, there was no not writing it. Like I was just living through such an intense moment where these sort of various, various intense things were converging. And I guess that thing that we sometimes call inspiration, inspiration is the in-breath, right? Oh, and then an out-breath must come. And the poem is in a sense that out-breath. I take a breath in because I'm anxious about something and then I breathe out and the poem comes. Uh, so I guess it's anxiety, my friend. It's anxiety that inspires me <laughs> on the first pass. It's not always the case. It depends on the moment, you know. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? Anyone have anything? Yeah. Marissa, says you can start your videos if you want. Are there other questions for question Marissa? From, from a colleague, uh, Conrad. She, she asked, how about the writer's titles she has been reading and enjoying recently? I'm, I'm so sorry, I didn't quite hear you, Emra. How about the writer's titles she has been reading and enjoying recently? I think she's asking about other writers for like oh, novels you've been reading and enjoying yeah, recently. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, what if I've been, just been teaching so intensely lately and not really reading all that much? Um, but what are some of the titles that I've enjoyed lately? Um, why don't I grab my pile that's here and show you some of them? Um, oh, so for instance, I've really been enjoying this novel by, um, Jordi Rosenberg called Confessions of the Fox. Um, a younger, very um, committed friend of mine, Leah Horlick, has just published this beautiful book called um, Modolvin Hotel, which is about actually her own journey back to um, Romania. Um, so she's based here in Calgary, um, but she was based in Vancouver. On, so we're on interestingly, curiously close timelines, Leah and I, and this is about, um, Yep, her journey back to Romania to think about um, the moment of the Second World War there and the expulsions of the violence against um, Jewish people. Um, Sarah Dowling's um, Entering Sappho has also been very interesting, thinking about the town of Sappho, Washington, and the use of classical names um, to name American cities um, and what it might be signifying in terms of, you know, in, in, in Sarah's case, queer white presences on stolen land, um, she's thinking about in that book. So those are the, some of the things I've been reading lately. Also, I've been reading just a lot of books um, from the 80s and 90s again, because I've been teaching um, a class on uh, cultural organizing um, on Turtle Island, north of the 49th through the 80s and 90s. So I've been going back to things like um, uh, um, Dion Brand's Map to the Door of No Return, Sky Lee's Disappearing Moon Cafe, Things I read ages ago, but um, and it's are still relevant in the present moment. So I've been reading, rereading those, probably most immediately trying to finish the class I'm teaching. Hard to read while you're teaching and writing and all those other things. <laughs> it is sometimes. All right, can I ask another question, if possible? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Larissa, go ahead. how about the translation of your works? Like, uh, have they been translated into other languages or like? Do you have projects of, for example, I don't know. I mean, I know that you have not been translated into Turkish, but you know, I don't know, German or French, like any developments in that regard? Yes, thank you, Amra, for that wonderful question. I would love it. 
I would love so much for my work to be translated. It has been a little bit. So I've had little fragments of things translated into Spanish. Um, the French translation of my second novel, Saltfish Girl, is just about to come out. So that's a biggie. I'm super excited about that. Um, there's also been a Japanese translation of Saltfish Girl, although it's not yet published. Um, no German translations yet, oddly, in spite of the fact that my German colleagues have been very generous in terms of inviting me to travel there and speak there, um, but no translations as such. So I would be so ex so excited about it. You know, I have a little crew of um, uh, friends who are translators, uh, mostly poets, who think about translation as itself. Um, a deeply creative process, and some of them have done that. So I'm thinking about people like Robert Maisels and uh, Juana Avasilikioi and um, uh, Aaron Moray, uh, who are wonderful translators uh, into French, mostly uh, Juana tra translates into Romanian as well. But um, I would love it. I would love it. I invite it if there are any listeners interested in doing that work. Yes, thank you very much. I think we have about 10 minutes max left, uh, Imra. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so are there other questions for Larissa while we have her here? Uh, so willing to answer questions for us. I think uh, maybe I can ask one more question if it is all right. Yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry Larissa. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you, Emra. I really appreciate it. It's very lovely. Yeah. Now, how do you see the representation of hope, maybe in pandemic fiction or, you know, in fiction that you're writing? Does hope play a, a pivotal role? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Emra. So thinking about... Or do you, do you believe that, you know, there should be hope as implicated within the internal structure of the text? Yes. Thank you, it's a really good question. You know, always in my novels, there is an element of it because I think it's really important to give, give people something to, to be, that to be too dark, that to be too pessimistic. There's a certain brutality in that if one doesn't offer an element of hope. Um, and so for me, for instance, in the Tiger Flu, the Grist sisters, in spite of, in spite of their suffering and in spite of their violence, um, they are a hopeful, they are meant to be a, a kind of a hopeful, a hopeful collective. I think we also need to be careful, you know, when we invoke hope. I think in the post-Obama era that it's, it's, it can be too easy to invoke hope. It can be not, yeah, it can, it can be easy to invoke hope in ways that don't actually produce hope or that don't produce generosity or kindness or compassion or some of those sort of other positive terms that I think are still necessary to invoke. Um, and it's, it's important to not be too easy about these things because, you know, as we've seen through, you know, um, sometimes the invocation can foreclose the possibility. And so I want to be careful about that. And I think it's part of the way, reason why I don't make my Gris sisters easy figures, you know, they're not easy. They can be, they can be stupid, they can be nasty, they can be jerks, right? And yet there's an ongoingness in those figures that I think is important. And so there, there, is, there is hope there. I think, yeah, one must strike a balance. So coming back to your question about utopia and dystopia, Emra, in a lot of ways that it's important for us to, to continue to see our own darkness. And it's impossible, it's, it's important for us also to see our own light and the Tao also does that, right? And it's, it, it wants the, the darkness in the light and the light in the darkness. And so maybe a sort of a, a, a deeper, more um, complex sense of hope um, might be at work in that, in that way of figuring. Um, I hope that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I hope that's what I'm doing in these yeah, so, so Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. It's Great the invocation of hope, like, is there a commercial pressure on the part of publishers? Because I'm not familiar with this part, but, you know, for example, when you produce such, uh, I mean, if you produce such dark or like kind of pessimistic like scenarios, like, is there in general a commercial pressure from the publishers to kind of make it more like hopeful? Right, yeah. I think that there can be. Um, I think that there can be, you know, Emra, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that one, to be honest. I'm working with, um, with Arsenal Pet, Arsenal Pulp Press, um, right now, which is, um, 
one of it just it's one of the larger but still a small press here in Canada and um one of the reasons that I that I work with them and that I stay with them is they, they give me a lot of latitude to do the things that I want to do um where you know in my various sort of forays into the into a, a, the, a sort of more mainstream field of publishing the kinds of things that that they, that they want me to do are so incredibly narrow. So there's still that pressure on memoir. There's still that pressure on autobiography. And it's not that I don't want to do memoir. I mean, the, the older I get, the more I'm like, oh, okay, maybe one day I'll do one, but it's not my primary interest. And so therefore I don't know an awful lot about what, what more they want because I've never been able to get past that one, to be honest. I was going to comment earlier, uh, Larissa, that I didn't for whatever reason, for other thoughts, I guess, that you'd had. Uh, but there's that interesting play by Drew Hayden Taylor, uh, Alternatives, or Alternatives, rather, yes. where uh, it talks about uh, an Indigenous man who you know, wants to write SF. He just wants to write SF. He doesn't want to be labeled as Indigenous or tell his stories. And his uh, Jewish girlfriend wants him to tell his stories as an Indigenous person. So you had mentioned that sort of, that's what I thought of immediately. Yes, well, yeah. Drew is hilarious. Like he's great because he's so sharp and he's so, you know, doesn't, doesn't give a S and uh, just calls it for what it is. Right. And I do think that that is still very much a thing. And in some ways, if I feel like there's something, there's a way in which Canada is a little bit backward, a little bit conservative. It's in that it's, if you're not white, you have to write memoir. It's like for crying out loud, give me a break. Right, and I think Drew is Drew. Drew sees that clearly. It's interesting now, you know, that um, some Indigenous authors, still not enough, but a small handful, are being able to are are able to write that and have it have it seen like at a you know at a national mainstream level. So thinking about folks like Sherry Demoline and Wab Gisha Grice and you know my lovely student Joshua Whitehead as well, um, starting to be able to. So that room is maybe is beginning to open up. Um, for, for a small handful of Indigenous folks. And I think that's really great. Like, I think it's wonderful. There needs to be more. Joshua's doing quite well right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's doing all right. Uh, I believe we're getting close to the end of the time here. Uh, were there any other questions for Larissa before we end the event? Can maybe one last question or? Emma, did you have another question that you wanted to ask since uh, you were asking? Just like, you know, as a follow-up to your comment, Larissa, like in terms of this kind of flowering of this indigenous culture, so I'm like, what do you think is the reason now for kind of welcoming this works like of, I think there's a growing interest uh, more and more in welcoming this non-anglophone like literature, so like these work cultures now, also kind of including uh, literatures other than like English literature, so literatures in English. What do you think is the reason now? In, do you mean in Canada or do you mean in Canada? Just in general, I think as far as I see now, for example, if I see publications by Rutledge or by Brad, by Brad, I think by bigger like publishers, you know, I've seen a lot of like, I think edited volumes that, which is great that concentrate on, for example, now Turkish literature or, you know, Arabic mm -hmm. literature. I think it has, it was not the case before. And then recently I've seen a lot of collections as such. Oh, Imra, I'm glad you have that impression. I'm not sure that I particularly do have that. Maybe opinion. I'm mistaken. I don't know. No, no, I'm sure it's not a mistake. I mean, I'm sure that you're thoughtful and, um, and you know, I mean, I'm witnessing you, Emra, paying attention to, to these things. So I'm glad to hear that that's your sense of things. It's hard for me to have a sense of what's happening. It's hard for me to have a sense of what's happening internationally. I mean, what I what what I'm witnessing here in Canada is. Um, you know, there's a, there's a partial recognition, maybe, at the level of the mainstream, in the wake of the truth and reconciliation, that some folks in the publishing industry are seeing the necessity of foregrounding Indigenous voices, and some are doing it. And I think in the wake of Black Lives Matter, that's beginning to happen for Black writing as well. Um, but I'm not sure that I feel that I'm really witnessing it happening on a large scale yet. 
Like there's a level of consciousness, largely because so much activism has been done, you know, by folks in those locations. I think it's really, really important. Um, and then in terms of, you know, those folks that we call BIPOC, I can see folks fighting hard. And I can see folks fighting in a, in a really particular language that's important, but not sufficient to the experience. And then if some books are coming out of it, I think that's good, but I'm not see, not sure that I'm seeing more than that. And it may be, you know, that I'm one of those people like thinking, oh gosh, it's not enough. We need to, you know, we need to keep pushing. So I'm glad to have that sense from you, Emma, that it's sort of registering at some level. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Maybe it's just also my kind of vicious circle, my small circle of like colleagues that I've seen, but at least also it is to some extent promising, I think. Yes, yeah, for sure. If you're if you're witnessing that, I do think it's promising. I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. I, yeah. Congrats. Thank you for answering my questions, Larissa. I appreciate those those uh, thoughtful answers today. Thank you so much for for coming up with them, Conrad, and for reading my work so carefully. I really appreciate it. It's been such an honor to be here. Yeah, I can I can maybe close the session by thanking like both like our speakers like. Thank you so much, Larissa, for taking your time and for answering all the questions that Conrad has really great session. And Conrad, you've done a really fantastic job in uh, with the questions and with the comments. Thanks so much. I think yeah, we really we really enjoyed it. And uh, I think both of you on behalf of my department and my university, and we really hope to welcome you one day in Cappadocia. So I was, you know, I was telling you about Cappadocia. So how, uh, what a magical night it is. So I hope you could visit us one day in person. I would love that. Thank you so much for everything, Emra, for hosting me, for, for encouraging me, for bringing me on. And again, Conrad, for the Thank you so My much. Pleasure. It's been My a pleasure. wonderful couple of hours. <laughs> and, yeah, and thank you everyone for your questions and for your comments. It's now, I will stop.